Okay, so um, welcome everyone. We are convening for another exciting boot camp meeting in our weekly Herrig meetings. And if we look over here on the schedule, now I've just dropped the link to the schedule for our webpage on the chat. If we kind of look down last week's um, is all caught up just as usual. And if we look at uh, what's happening today, we're just really carrying on. If you notice from the schedule I sent around from um, the email today, there are 12, 12 sessions in the uh, the R meetings. Really, if people have come into some of them and you miss a few of them, shouldn't be a big deal. But I guess I would say that um, the meetings so far have been fairly slow and careful. And uh, after today, we're we're going to just go through a series of the basic statistics in R. We've covered all sorts of topics over the years in here, and um, we tend to go through uh, introductory sessions like this. Uh, I think we have tended to do it about twice a year on average for the past few years. Um, <clears throat> the thing that I've noticed is that um, often people will um, will get into analyzing their own data and they'll come across uh, a, a more nuanced or a more, I, I hesitate to use the word difficult problem, but uh, maybe a more advanced problem or something. And uh, th then we come into those kinds of topics uh, for most of the year in here. So um, I guess that I wanted to say that from today's topic onwards, uh, we'll be looking at the nuts and bolts of actually performing basic statistics. Most of these are the traditional statistics that uh, that that we've moved beyond. You know, we use something called the the generalized linear model or the general linear model these days, and that's what you see in papers. And creeping into the ag literature um, is, are tools like machine learning and uh, other information theoretic tools. Um, I see a few economists uh, in the group, and economists are pretty good statisticians. I, I, I don't I don't give the compliment out lightly. You know, they they tend to use uh, the general linear model or the generalized linear models and mixed effects models routinely. And so, to get in into the literature, there uh, really the minimum you need is beyond what the boot camp does, but. Um, once you have the R tool set, we'll move on to those topics in the future. Now, today's topic is um, exploring data. It's the the first topic. If we look at this sidebar on the website, um, I have the boot camp conceptually organized into two modules. This is not perfect, but it is the way that I've found through a lot of trial and error that works best for people where we've spent the time up to now learning the nuts and bolts of the R language. This has some downsides. Um, the downside is that we're kind of going through a lot of boring stuff that people don't necessarily care about. They want to analyze their data. You know, you want to analyze your data. So we we have spent a lot of time you know, we haven't yet analyzed any data really, just learning the tools. Now we are moving on to the part where we will analyze some data. Um, the reason I've done it this way, I have explained this before in earlier sessions, but just to reiterate it, is that um, if we, you can try to start the conceptual part first uh, and then learn the language as you go along. And it just doesn't work as well for R as it does for other other kinds of languages. So if you know enough now to read in your data set, uh, which, <laughs> which in a way, uh, understanding that one point is probably the most important thing of all of these uh, first weeks in the module, you know, now we're ready to do some stuff with that data. So that's a way to think about it. I'm just gonna go back to our uh, section. And as usual, if you'd like to, um, I'm just gonna refresh this for myself. <clears throat> I hadn't refreshed the screen, um, but you can see that I have the the rest of the boot camp modules up to session 12. I did mention in the email that I tend to cap this off with a couple of sessions on um, 
using a tool called GitHub that's a best practice, modern best practice for uh, documenting database projects and, and your code. And then maybe a session on uh, Markdown. This is a way to automate automate report writing. You can be quite sophisticated with it. One of my PhD students is writing his PhD thesis with Markdown. I'm a little afraid for him because uh, formatting stuff is uh, really terrifically bad for, uh, for PhD theses. But um, anyway, you can do a lot of things with it, and sometimes it's uh, easy and fun to do those things. So we'll probably have a session on that. Until then, we're going to, if you want to follow along with me, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger for people. You know, follow along with me. You can download the slides. And um, here's the link to the boot camp page. So I'm just going to open up as a test the slides I've just made. I'm going to uh, share this with you on my shared screen. And you should be able to see that. And you should be able to see my head. Now, is my screen spotlighted for everyone? I think it is. Just yell if uh, anything looks funny and um, we'll try to do something about it. Till then, I'm going to arrange myself so I can keep one little eye on chat. And if anybody has any questions, as usual, we're doing this very informally, just uh, unmute. You can take your chances in the chat. I might notice it, but um, unmuting and just saying something in the mic is is good. When we get to the live coding part, I will um, alert you and tell you the time that you can start up your R and you can code along with me if you want to. I do recommend doing that if if you can um, if you can multitask like that. Okay, so continuing with the boot camp. And what are we doing today? Today's exploring data with R. Now, um, one kind of metaphor, you know, I like the metaphors uh, for exploring your data is weighing the pig. And uh, this has a lot of um, important functions. Um, it's just sizing up the data. It's just quantifying the data. It's uh, the first thing that you should do. And usually there's even a role for it in an academic paper where you report back uh, your course of data collection in a way that just describes it in enough detail that maybe somebody else could replicate it, or at least they can understand it with respect to the results you're about to, um, to present and the claims you're going to make on top of those results. Now, uh, we, we use the weighing of the pig um, for, for sometimes for question formulation. So it does have a role in question formulation. Uh, now, these aren't, don't don't confuse this with your hypothesis. Um, question formulation here is, uh, are things like, do I, do I meet my assumptions for a particular statistical model? We'll be talking a lot about that in the future. Um, we also just summarize the data. Uh, one of the, one of the EDA tasks I've done recently where I've, I've summarized the data, where I was given a sample of data for a large study. Now, uh, you can imagine um, that this study is, uh, it's actually about the spatial distribution for um, precision agriculture of slugs and slug damage in fields. This particular study has uh, around 30 fields across the UK, and each field is sampled in a one hectare frame, and each one hectare in a uh, 10 by 10 meter grid um, has uh, has uh, 100 sampling points for slug traps and also 100 sampling points for soil data and uh, some other sampling points for some other things. And uh, I was given the data set to do a test run and develop a statistical method that we could run all the data through. and. I weighed the pig for the one field that I was given. Um, now on this test data set, there were um, three sampling occasions. So they're sampling each field through time. So I wanted to weigh the pig uh, in various ways for this data, just to see if the data were correct and intact, because this was collected by farmers and agronomists uh, rather than scientists. 
And uh, one of the things I did is I just asked if I've got three sampling occasions and I expect 100 sampling points for per occasion, I should have 300 points of data. And it turned out uh, here I, I had 310 points of data. And I was working with someone who um, passed the data to me and I said, well, there's 310 data points, something's wrong in there. And they said, oh, no, no, no. Um, we, uh, we, we named the rows that were sampling uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so forth, uh, H, I, J, but we, we omitted I because we thought that the farmers would not be able to, to get confused between I and J. I'm thinking to myself, what kind of farmers are we working with guys that can't tell the difference between I and J? But uh, they had in fact um, removed I, so they had skipped that and gone to J. And so the, the explanation was no, I think you, um, I think somebody has just added that I in anyway, incorrectly. So I, I looked at all the I's and J's and everything that I had, I didn't have any I's. But for one of the um, columns, I had uh, uh, 39 points where I should have had 30. And for another one, I had 31. And I, I wouldn't have known that without, you know, weighing the pig. Uh, so this becomes a habit. It's very, um, very useful. We also look at our variables and we transform them if we need to. We do graphing to describe our data during, during uh, the EDA. I'll make a contrast um, between analysis versus exploratory data analysis, which is um, part of weighing the pig. And also I'll briefly talk about um, what I refer to as a statistical analysis plan. I'm going to pitch the concept to you and argue to you that um, you all should, everybody in this chat should be creating a statistical analysis plan, a formal one that is designed for consumption by other people before you collect any data under any circumstance. I'll explain to you why I have that strong opinion. All right, so um, what about question formulation and hypothesis testing? I just have a few slides here that um, I hope is just the basis to review for, for everybody. But um, we use this, this framework as scientists called uh, uh, null hypothesis testing. And um, for that, we, we have a couple of assumptions that we make. Like one of the assumptions is that we have defined our population of interest. Um, if you're Let's say, let's do a distant example with this. Um, if you're a medical, a human medical researcher, your population of interest might be, you know, all people over 50 years of age. Maybe you're, maybe you're studying hypertension in humans. Your population of interest might be all people over 50 years of age. Um, now, if you're an agriculture researcher, uh, maybe you're working in beef, let's say. Uh, maybe your um, population of interest is a particular breed of, of beef cows or maybe a particular hybrid. Um, now, this, this part is often implicit in experimental designs and probably it's best practice if we're not at all implicit but very explicit about the population of interest. This is so important because um, this should dictate our design of uh, samples and our sampling regime. So the population of interest is something that we can't measure every individual in our population of interest. Um, instead, we sample around that population so that we can make an inference about the whole population. And the more we sample it, the more precise we are going to be able to make inferences about the population of interest. Now, I know this is stuff we teach the children in school about the scientific method, but I find the specification of the population of interest and the design of sampling in particular to be really just flagrantly um, violated uh, in practice. And we should uh, really keep this in the forefront of our mind. Now, for null hypothesis testing, we have this concept of test statistics as well. And we'll look at loads of these in the next few weeks. Every kind of statistical test has its own 
test statistic. And uh, the idea of the test statistic is that it it is a quantification of um, a magnitude. I'm trying to write letters with my mouse because I don't have my tablet set up. But um, a way to think of what this magnitude means is that it's a measure of the bigness of some difference or some effect that you're interested in. That you have a hypothesis about smaller your test statistic generally means um, that there's no effect. And uh, we we represent formally that uh, that state of no effect with the null hypothesis. Um, now, I just wanted to mention this stuff. I'm going to come back to it at the end of these slides, um, but th these concepts will all be very familiar to all of you, I'm sure. The thing I want to take just a moment and talk about is the p-value. Yes, uh, some of you may be aware that it, the p-value itself has become controversial uh, across different scientific disciplines. There, there are various reasons for why why it's um, controversial. One of the reasons is um, one of the reasons is that we, uh, as statisticians uh, and and other people who are applied statisticians who think about the philosophy of statistics, have uh, have created evidence that um, that the p value is a uh, biased measure across different kinds of studies. W one that they tend not to be reproducible, and two, um, e even if p-values are small due to random effects with small sample sizes, positive um, positive conclusions where you have a small p-value tend to be overrepresented compared to random in the literature. So there's, there's uh, um, this bias that's inherent based on our practice of using the p-value. I don't, I could give a whole lecture about that. It's a fascinating topic and there are, is a whole literature on it for reproducing studies. But the, the thing I really wanted to say here is that um, people are concerned enough about it professionally that uh, including regular applied scientists, including non-statisticians, that in some fields, um, in, including very serious fields like, like human medical biology and, and others, that uh, they, have, they have come up with alternatives. One alternative is, is Bayesian statistics, so-called Bayesian statistics. And uh, this is a way, one of the things I like about Bayesian statistics, it's not usually associated with it, is that um, it, it formalizes our thinking about the population of interest a lot more than the null hypothesis testing framework that, um, that we use now. May come back to that if, if people are interested in talking about that in a future meeting, I will. Now, there are the benefits for the null hypothesis testing framework. <coughs> It's familiar to everybody. Um, typically, it's robust to assumptions we make uh, under these traditional statistics. There's a strong framework for evidence that's widely accepted by a lot of people. And, and you know, the basic idea is very simple. We do indeed teach it to children in school. But um, <clears throat> the, some of the criticisms and some of the alternatives that have arisen are because um, it's observed that uh, that the results of null hypothesis testing are often interpreted under error, either because um, the validation of the analysis is neglected, assumptions testing is neglected. Um, there's also a, a, a lot of evidence that the formal part of teaching these quantitative tools has declined over a short period of time. Um, so the the modern way of teaching stats in uh, the applied disciplines is to embed it in different modules and have fewer math and statistics uh, kinds of modules of themselves. Uh, this is another kind of big topic that people don't agree about. But um, we probably all like to magically know more about statistics, no matter how we use them. Uh, but a big one, one that I think is the most common one that everyone should be concerned with is that oftentimes as a practitioner, uh, there are subtleties in data analysis that um, it's very difficult to be an expert in 
uh, it, it's very difficult because it takes a lot of practice to do it and uh, we have to start somewhere. This is a problem that uh, even better education and different methods um, can't get away from. So just the fact that people are coming to a meeting like this is a good sign. People want to um, learn more about the subtleties. OK, so um, we're going to go through some examples of doing the weighing the pig process. We've got an, an example data set, the chick weight data set. Um, we're going to think about a hypothesis for this data set. Now, oftentimes we're just using this toy data set to uh, demonstrate ways of, of looking at and partitioning the data and looking at the code. But uh, I want to still keep in the back of our minds that the philosophy of doing this kind of work uh, has to start with a hypothesis, and that should happen really before we collect the data. OK, so I don't want that to be any any um, confusion about that. So uh, when we have the hypothesis, it's basically how we think the world works, you know, or what, what you think is true. Sometimes we're we teach the kids in school to formally state the null hypothesis, but grown up scientists don't tend to do that really. Let me go back over to um, the web page. I'll just drop in once again the, um, the link to the web page. And um, I think I'm going down to the section three. So I've already covered the other sections in the slides. And uh, we're going to, if you want to follow along, you can download this uh, Chicks data set. You can put it um, anywhere you like. I think I'm going to uh, put it in the folder that I have handy. And you can open up your RStudio if you want to play along. And now I can see that my chicksweights.xlsx is in my directory. It wasn't there a minute ago. I should have demonstrated that. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see. I've gone ahead ahead of time and I've saved a script. Um, please, if you do want to follow along with this and you need a little extra time to set up, just yell out. But otherwise, I'm going to slowly talk you through the process of how I think everybody should run the code at some point. You can watch me go through it and then run it yourself later. That's fine. But I know some people have told me they've been coding along in real time, so um, that's fine too. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that with the little clipboard symbol. That will that will copy everything here, and I'm going to paste it um, <clears throat> paste it in. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. And um, I have the instruction here to uh, to try this. Make a little clickable table of contents for section three with the two hashes at the beginning and four at the end. So I have a clickable table of contents. OK, so uh, the instruction is to download the um, chick weights Excel file, read it into a data object called chicks, and convert the feed variable to a factor if necessary. So um, on the web page, I described the data set just a little bit. Um, but let's have a have a peek at it before we open it up. Just um, how it looks in the in the file. Let me navigate to it on my computer. Believe that it's going to be in here. Let's just open it up. we go look at the top and make it a little bit bigger for everybody you can see that um, it's just a weight and a feed column and I've got a data dictionary here in the tab called data description and you can see that um, the weight is a numeric variable and it's six week old chick weights and grams 
and that the feed is a is a factor. It's unordered. It's a food supplement type, and there are six levels. I didn't list the levels here, but to make this really a tidy data dictionary, I, I probably should have. This is from a, a classic um, data analysis agriculture textbook, which I, I tracked down and bought at some point. Um, I've got a copy of it, but uh, we can see that they were looking at interested in growth rates for um, chick weights on horse bean, linseed, soybean, sunflower, meat meal, and cassian uh, enriched food. Okay, so um, we've looked inside the raw data now, and uh, you know, we didn't really know what to expect, but the data dictionary cleared it up. So have a think about that, because um, a nice clear data dictionary in a, in a tidy format is a, just a lovely thing. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and read in the open XLSX library, which we need to be able to read in. Um, we need it to read in our, um, our Excel file. Now, in the olden days, the last time that I, when I wrote the boot camp, that is, I, um, I had a data structure on my own computer like this. And the idea is that, you know, you would need to, to change that to your own file path. What I recommend doing for everybody here, if you're taking notes or if you're following along, is uh, a new shortcut to um, using RStudio. Is if we go up to session, and we set our working directory to the source file location. OK, so I'll, I'll demonstrate that. If but anybody is really interested in hard coding the um, the path on your own computer. This works really well for Windows. Um, Macs, it doesn't work as well to do this. But if we paste that in, we have to remember that the the backslash is because R is based on a, a Linux kernel. We have to change these backslashes that Windows likes to use to uh, forward slashes. So if I go ahead down here and I just do this little experiment and I, I get my working directory. I'm asking the butler, can you just please tell me what you think my working directory is? And it'll print it out in the console. Here it comes. Three, two, one. Don't uh we don't need to remove spaces. Um are there there aren't any spaces in that, but if if you have spaces in yours, as long as it's in double quotes, you don't need to remove spaces. It should work. So um, now it, it does indeed think that my working directory is um, exactly where the file is. So everything's working good. I've just double checked it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and run line 22 anyway, which should have no effect. It should just repeat it down in the console. Three, two, one. When nothing happens down here, that's a good sign. When you're setting your working directory with the set WD function. That means that uh, the butler has found the place that you have indicated. Um, so we can just print our working directory again, and it's, of course, the same. OK. Now, um, line 24 is just the thing we've done it before. It's read.xlsx. There are other ways to read in your Excel files. This is the way that I like to do. Um, you can with this function, if I just um, hit my F1 and bring up the help file. You can specify the sheet. You can specify the starting row if there is weird stuff happening up in the, the top of it. And you can specify quite a lot of stuff. This is my favorite way to work with Excel sheets in R. There is one that um, is that other people swear by. It's, it's uh, read underscore Excel. I think that's in the tidyverse. So um, it's fine if you have another way that you like to do it or one that you've found on. But let's go ahead and read this in. I'm going to um, bring up my global environment. You can just watch up here for the chick state object to pop up. Three, two, one. There it is. 71 observations of the two variables. There they are. We can um, look at the class of the chick's feed variable because remember that instruction that we're going to set it to be a factor in case it isn't a factor when it read in and it isn't it's read in as a character um 
Now, the passive aggressive butler of R will oftentimes, depending on what you want to do, it, it will infer uh, if a if you're using a character vector in a place where it expects a factor, it will sometimes correctly guess that you want it to be a factor. So uh, this isn't necessary uh, all the time, what I'm about to do demonstrate, but it it's something that I like to do just so that I am positive. I know how the world is working and what the butler is going to do for me when I ask him to do something in the R um, global environment here. So the first thing I'm going to do is have it print out the class of the feed variable, chicks, cash sign feed, three, two, one. And we know it's a character. We, we can just look up here, but this is a formal fast way to do it. And then I'm going to use the factor variable on the chicks cache feed vector. And I'm going to put the result of that into the same variable chicks cache sign feed. This is a very simple piece of code, but um, it's doing something fairly sophisticated. So I'll just explain it for just a second. Um, so here we're taking this, this vector, 3, 2, 1, I'm going to print it out. It's just a character vector of all those things. We're converting it to a factor. When I tell it, when I tell it um, the R system to convert that to a factor just using the code that's highlighted there, 3, 2, 1, it does indeed print out um, a factor in the console. But notice it hasn't changed anything up in the global environment. So I need to tell it to put the new factor I made into something. And I want it to just overwrite the old feed variable. There's no reason to keep it, um, but it's destroying the old variable and making a brand new one that's instead of factor with all the exact values. Three, two, one. You were looking up here in the global environment. You see we've now got the factor that we wanted to replace the old one. And now we can check the class again, three, two, one. And it is indeed a factor. Okay, so that's just a little housekeeping for the um, for the data set. Um, now we want to we want to think about our hypothesis, and um, we uh, we want to really look at whether the chick weights differ after the six weeks they've been on the feeds according to food additive type. I mean, um, of course, I'm telling you that, but there really is no other hypothesis that that uh, could happen, or at least not not many other hypotheses that could happen within this the space of this uh, this data set. So uh, we're we're going to examine in some way the mean chick weights uh, according to feed additive type, and uh, of course we're also going to in addition to the differences in the means we are going to be concerned about the the differences in the um, variation within and between the means. Okay, so if, if you've had some basic stats before, we're talking about analysis of variance, which which we will cover in, in pretty good detail in a few weeks. Okay, so um, the, the kind of stuff that we want to do here is we usually want to evaluate how much data there is, what those means are, are there any weird extreme values, any outliers, and, and we we also want to start graphing right away to just look at all of those things graphically because we can do those really, really quickly. We'll talk about a lot of things in the coming weeks and we'll look at some of them today indeed, um, like the fact that uh, we often make the assumption of the Gaussian distribution for measured variables. Why people sometimes ask me, do I insist on calling the normal distribution the Gaussian distribution? So I, I like to explain to people why. It's not just that I'm an ultra nerd, uh, but I am an ultra nerd, but it's not just that I'm an ultra nerd. It really is that uh, if we call the Gaussian distribution the normal distribution, it has often and is often interpreted as meaning that the, the Gaussian is the typical distribution. And I'm here to tell you that for, for many kinds of data, it is not typical. There are different um, distributions that are, are typical for them or are normal for them. So I do it to be clear 
not to be um, anal retentive. Uh, we are also interested in the variance or the standard deviation, uh, or um, we might be interested in the standard error. So we may come across those in this code example. So we're going to try this. Let's look at the code. We're going to go back. I think this is section 3.2. So I'm going to put in another table of contents. Uh, we've reached the limits of magnification for getting in all the comments that have put in here. So um, here we are. So the first thing we're going to do is summarize the whole data set. Now, um, a lot of people take this for gospel when I talk to them about the uh, summary function. This function is it is pretty useful if we use it on a whole whole data frame. It will go through and uh, if we have a numeric variable, it will it will produce summary statistics for numeric variables. And if we have a factor, it will produce um, summary statistics for a factor. Let's just um, dump it down in the console. Three, two, one. And have a look at it. So for the weight variable, we can see that um, the range. So we've got the minimum value and the maximum value. It's a pretty big range uh, for for these chick weights. We can see the mean. Uh, the median. Now the median and the mean, the, the mean is the um, arithmetic mean. It's the sum of everything divided by the number of observations. The median is the, um, the most common or the middle value. And if the median and the mean are um, very close to one another, it is evidence that uh, we we're close to what we expect for the Gaussian distribution. So there's a bit of information in here. We also have the uh, range of the first and third quartile, and it's within these values that 50% of the, um, the total values go. And if they're symmetrical around the mean, again, that's something we, we just eyeball to, uh, to see if um, we have a, a Gaussian distributed data vector. For the feed, uh, it's a bit different for a categorical variable. Here we're having counts of each of the occurrences of these. So we can see that we have uh, more or less uh, about 11 or 12 observations, 10, 11, 12, and 14. So a, a good amount, more than 10 for all of them and up to 14 for some of them. So it just gives us a summary of the frequency. <laughs> we can also, um, um, do a summary for um, for certain portions of the data set. So here we're using some of the um, the syntax that we learned last week, where we're slicing out a bit from the chick weight column. If we print all of that out, remember there's this little trick. It's a free experiment you can constantly use in R to help figure out what's going on in code. If I just print out the highlighted version, it's all of the chick weight, three, two, one. And if I just print out all of the chick feed like we did before, um, three, two, one, we've got that factor. But if I if I um, pick out which chick feed is equivalent to um, to Cassian, so notice I, I haven't yet selected the which. It's just this Boolean expression: yes or no, true or false. Does chick cash feed? Um, equal the value Cassian, three, two, one. So we have a vector, 71 places long of uh, falses and trues. And we can see that the last the last values there um, are the Cassian values. And if I ask the which function to uh, resolve that Boolean expression, we should get the, the numerical values of the addresses in the vector where those uh, values live. Three, two, one. Whoops, what have I done? I have not included, uh, I've included one too many brackets. There we go. So uh, for the um, row numbers, 60 to 71, we could just count that 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60 is the first true. Um, it just is a way to grab automatically the values that uh, we exactly want. And if I wrap these, um, the vector of these row numbers in 
the square uh, notation, oops, in the square notation for the vector of chick weights, so square brackets there and one at, at the end um, right there, if I ask that, it's going to give me just the chick weights that uh, that are at those row numbers, three, two, one. So there they are. So we learned this last week. This is just review. And if I ask the summary to uh, to summarize just for Cassian, three, two, one, we get the same kind of summary statistics for that one, and we can do it for horse bean, three, two, one, and we can just eyeball and compare. Now these little um, summary utility functions are trivial to use. Uh, we don't use them all the time. I wouldn't go through and do this for all of these variables. I'd never do that. It, I, in fact, first I'd probably make a, a, a graph, and then if I wanted these values for a table, I would I would calculate them a little bit later on for that for that outcome. I'm just uh, just demonstrating the tool set at this point. We have talked about aggregate. Let's look at it again, just to remind you. This is a way to create data frames that are themselves summaries, and we can specify the the function. Or you know, you've got to put the fun into uh, any kind of statistics. So we have that fun argument there. So we could um, aggregate, just like we did last week, chick weight by chick's feed. Remember, there's this little thing, weird thing about the aggregate function in R. It requires it to be a list type variable. And then we're going to apply the function mean three, two, one. So we can use the aggregate function to automate the calculation of the mean and the standard deviation or the standard error and any statistic that we want to uh, build into this. And just to demonstrate um, with this kind of template code, you can calculate all of the simple statistics. This is for standard deviation three, two, one. There we go. We looked at last week how to um, aggregate both of them, which I just demonstrate again here. Here we're aggregating chick's weight by that same list feed, but here the function is a function that we define. So we're, we want to um, do some work. Remember all functions, a way to think about them. I've, I've tried to think of various metaphors for people to think about it. I think about them as tools. They're anything that do work for us uh, in any programming language. Um, and here we're trying to do work on something that we are going to pass. Uh, to the function. So in this case, we're passing whatever X is. And remember, we set X here to, to chick weight. And then in the curly brackets, we specified that we want to um, take the standard deviation divided by the square root of the length. That's the square root of the sample size. This is how we calculate the standard error. So three, two, one, and we have the standard error. Standard error, if you don't remember, is just the way to um, the sample size affects um, our estimation of variance from when we're sampling from a population. And uh, the standard error uh, corrects because of this term right here. It corrects our estimation of the, the variance relative to our sample size. And if you'll remember the uh, sample sizes were different for those different food additives. So he, this is a very practical and common way to use it here. We could also provide um, several functions. We could do this all together and wrap the mean standard deviation and the standard error um, all together. So uh, we, and here I've named them as well. I've, I've combined them and I've um, set them to a value that I've chosen, mean standard deviation in SEM, three, two, one. And uh, so then we get the mean of X standard deviation of X and the standard error, the mean of X. So uh, this this kind of stuff is stuff we um, might not do on every data set, but it's very practical and we do use it. Um, it comes in on really handy sometimes. OK, so we've gone all of that and now we're going to go back to the slides a little bit. <coughs> So variables and graphing. Now, you can have whole, whole, you know, twelve-week courses on graphing and stuff like that. And we're not really talking about all the theory of graphing and human perception and scientific norms and everything like that. 
thing I'll do in the coming weeks is I'll I'll go through um, types of graphs that are associated with certain types of statistics, and I'll make the point a little bit later today that um, that we should be thinking in terms of uh, not in terms of um, the first graph we think of for our data, but we we usually if we're going to communicate um, a some evidence to someone else based on data we collected, we want to we want to pair the best practice exemplar for the type of graph to the specific statistical test or summary that we're trying to convey. And uh, the framework we're, we're doing this within is claims and evidence. So we want to create the appropriate evidence for the claim that we want to make. And that goes for graphs as well as statistics. I'll emphasize that a lot in the coming weeks. So um, here are just some real basics uh, that apply even, even um, for for uh, graphical summaries that we're going to be talking about today, but we, we have to make graphs that convey relevant information. Uh, if we have redundant or irrelevant information, it's it's obviously uh, uh, less than ideal. We want our graphs to be consistent in aesthetics. We want the fonts to be the same. We want the font, font sizes to be the same. We want the color, if used, to have meaning, and we want to be consistent with that meaning. These are little details, uh, but they really separate uh, they really separate great work from mere work. Uh, the graph should be self-contained, and, and our norms in scientific communication are that you should have a figure legend tied to a graph that someone could open up to, and they should be able to understand the uh, the whole story by reading the figure legend contained within your graph. So that's really what I mean by self-contained. It's even better if you need minimal text to accompany the graph, which is definitely achievable. Um, if, you're, if you're writing a scientific paper, um, unless you're making a purely descriptive graph, like with a function of weighing the pig or um, explicitly describing the data that um, is not associated with a test or hypothesis, uh, it should explicitly reflect your hypothesis. In other words, um, an example of this, this is maybe an advanced example, but I think everybody here will understand this, that um, if you if you make a, if you do a statistical test and you transform your data with a log transformation, let's say, that, uh, and you present that as a result you're going to stand on, then when you present a graph, the graph should also reflect that log transformation. Um, a, another more crude example is when you have bar charts and you show um, like a result like this and uh, you look at the y-axis and uh, you know this looks like a huge difference but over here it's like you know 40.1 and this is like uh, you know 40 Point two, you know, so you're you've because you've truncated the axis here, it's an error of omission that um, may or may not reflect the actual hypothesis, and there, there probably wouldn't be a, a difference between this otherwise. Uh, it also should be appropriate to the data. Um, a pet peeve of mine is when we measure something like chick weight, uh, and in some in some fields, an old-fashioned way of representing a, a variable like a weight would be to make a bar chart like this that has whiskers on it at the top. And that's not quite right because the um, for measuring chick weight, we would never have any values that go down to zero for a continuous measure like that. And really, we should best practice dictates, and and it has done. This is not a, like a new thing. Uh, best practice has dictated that we use um, something that represents the central tendency like uh, box plots. Box plots are probably the best for this kind of data, but but dot and whisker plots um, are probably second best and these are um, these are the worst. Anyway, that's what I mean by appropriate to data. There are some um, standards for this. 
think the last little bit of coding we're going to do is uh, something that it's not unique to R, but I <clears throat> I find that when you're learning to build graphs, um, when you're learning to build graphs using the R tool set, that this is something that uh, surprises people and takes them a while to wrap their heads around. So I usually introduce it right up front, and it's the concept of layering. And um, I should say about R that it has uh, really, really good graphics capabilities. Um, a lot of graphs you see in published papers these days are in, in fact made with R, and uh, the sophistication of the graphs, uh, you have 100% control, and yet you can make really good graphs with, without much effort. So we're going to look at that. So let me see. I think I'm going to go to the layering code. So I've got a series of graphs here, and I'm using um, this to look at the distribution, so a histogram of that chick's data. So I'm just going to copy that, go to my R. This is section 4.3. So uh, here we're going to be using the histogram chart. Now, when we look at the the uh, central tendency of a single variable, um, and and we're interested in the distribution, um, we use histograms. And uh, here I'm going to look at the histogram for the chick weight variable. Three, two, one. That's it. Uh, if we kind of imagine a a bell-shaped curve on here. It, it's lumpy, but it, it does approximate a, a, a Gaussian kind of distribution. That's funny. This is a phenomenon that I'll just briefly mention here with the fact that it does somewhat resemble a bell-shaped curve, is that it, it really shouldn't represent a bell-shaped curve. This is one of the fundamental misunderstandings of simple statistics that is pervasive for a lot of people, is that we have um, in this single vector, we have um, we know we have variables that have different means. You can see them here, and so uh, we expect a Gaussian to come from the same population. But we know that this is a sample that comes from six different populations, and this lumpiness is because there are six different Gaussian populations that are all kind of crammed together here. So this is a this is like a I hope it's a revelation for some people when they start thinking of data in this way. We're going to kind of ignore that for now, though. So we're just looking at the concept of layering up a good graph. So I'm going to go. This makes the basic histogram, but you know, now maybe, maybe we decide that this title is terrible. Look at that. It's the default title, and it has um, R code in it. So let's make a better, a better version of this. That's got a um, a, uh, a a title that we choose in here. Now if I bring up the help for histogram or for any for any um any of the functions, but this is particularly useful for, for plotting functions and other simple ones, we can see some of these. We can see there's a main that happens to be the title, the um X limit that defines the the um numerical limits of both axes, X lim and Y lim. The X lab and Y lab are uh, the name of the X label and Y label. So uh, here, all we've done is we've just adding a, a main title, three, two, one. And there we go, we've shaped the title. It looks a bit funny because my screen is so magnified to help people see it, but it looks better at lower magnifications, but I'll, I'll keep the uh, magnification big to keep it easy to read. Okay. So um, maybe we, um, after we take care of the main, maybe we notice that, yeah, also now that we've got a good main title up there, our X label looks crummy. So we want to add an X label, so I'm going to add a new layer. Just going to pull that up, add it in there. And um, if I treat the basic code here as a template, you can do a series of free experiments where you just build up um the graph that you want and uh at each of these steps 
you should crit critique your own work. Maybe, you know, deciding each step of the way what you want to improve. Maybe we want to add a line for the overall mean. So uh, to do that in exploratory, this is something in exploring the data steps that um, that I like to do quite a lot. If, if you've worked with me doing graphing, you will have seen me do this. So we'll um, just add a, a new one. And I uh, will draw our graph again. And uh, this is another aspect of layering uh, where now I want to draw a a line representing the grand mean over the top of this. And uh, to do that, I'm using the AB line function. What does AB line mean? It literally just, it's like a, a joke that the R creators made. It, it's a line from A to B where you specify the starting and the stopping point. It's a very flexible function that does a lot of different things. If, if we want to draw a vertical line and we run this, um, we want run this um, this function after we've made a graph. It will always place the line we ask for on top of the uh, the uh, base layer for the existing graph. So here I'm choosing to draw a vertical line. The line I'm um, choosing to make will will be the mean of the chick's weight, three, two, one. So it's going to draw it on the it's going to draw a vertical line centered on this value, 261 point blah, 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 on the x-axis. And I'm specifying I want the color red. I want the line type to be dashed. That's what number two stands for. And the line width to be three pixels, three, two, one. Of course, we can, we can alter all of the details here. Uh, you know, we could make it a, a dotted line and we could make it a, a really thick dotted line. Three, two, one. Um, notice how I've run it twice and it's drawn the second one also on top of the layer. So uh, if we really wanted to make our graph just with that second line, we'd run everything again. Three, two, one. This is the way we layer graphs. And uh, we're going to try a box plot. The thing I like to say with box plots, um, we're going to make a box plot of chick weight. A lot of people think that box plots are um, are named as such because they are boxes, but um, they're actually named after the famous statistician George Box, who humbly named it after himself. And all of these bits of the box plots, we'll talk about them in coming weeks, uh, have information that we can exploit. It's, uh, it's why it is the uh, norm to make lots of different data like this. What we're really interested in, though, is plotting the um, the means for all of the feed types. And um, to do that, we, we might want to exploit this formula. We haven't talked about our formulas before, um, but I'm just going to demonstrate this today and then leave it for when we talk about statistical models in the future to fully explain it. But uh, what this symbology means is um, we want to uh, graph weight uh, as a function of, that's what the little tilde symbol means, uh, as a function of the feed type. And if we wrap that in the box plot function, um, specifying our data to be the chicks data, what we get is um, a different box for each of the different variable types. Notice how down here all of the variables didn't display properly. So again, it's because of the font that I've used. And if I make it a little bit smaller, it will re-render and, and do those. There are all sorts of tricks we can use to make this really pretty, but we're not concerned about that today. The thing that jumps out at you, even before we've done any analysis really, is that there's a huge effect of food additive on chick weight. Of course, we would expect that based on these additives. It's the point of the experiment. It's what we think is true. It's how we think the world works. Uh, and this is a function of exploring your data. Now, we're, we've reached the end of our time. I just want to um, quickly look at where we're at and finish up real quick so we don't grossly go over time. Looks like we uh, have a few more graphs. 
but I think most of them are conceptual and I'm just going to finish this in five minutes. If you have to go, I understand no problem, but we'll finish right up. I think that's the end of the coding. So uh, I want to make a distinction between analysis uh, per se and EDA. You know, exploring your data, EDA is informal and it's haphazard and we use it to just gain understanding about the data, whether there are errors in it. We use it sometimes to test assumptions. Um, we usually don't make EDA to show to other people. This is for our own edification so that we can create that evidence we plan to show to others. And uh, we usually do this before we perform an analysis. And as opposed to that, our analysis it is always designed to fit a particular hypothesis. That's in the null hypothesis testing framework, of course. We uh, we create an analysis for presentation to others. And, uh, you know, we think of this presentation to others as um, evidence that we're going to use to support claims. This is a way that, you know, I personally think about creating a talk that I'm going to show other academics or writing a, um, a an academic paper. Best practice dictates that it, uh, your analysis should be reproducible by someone else. Your data has to be available for that and, and the code has to be there. Uh, it's not reproducible if you're using software that, that doesn't um, document the analysis by code. Not exactly. All right. Now, uh, this last part is um, also just a best practice that uh, prior to data collection, really you should make a statistical analysis plan. It's it's my opinion that uh, taught students and postgraduate students at the beginning, early on in their project should all formally have a statistical analysis plan. If you're a taught student, I believe that it should be marked. It shouldn't be just something um, that uh, that students do as a as a hurdle. There should be a cost to making a good statistical analysis plan. So here at Harper, for our taught students, we do have a, a very um, light form of statistical analysis plan, but it isn't marked, and I, I think it should be. So um, prior to data collection, we should formally state our hypotheses. We should formally state the statistical model we're going to use to resolve these hypotheses. We should specify what data we're going to collect, and we should specify how much data we're going to collect. Now, in, in practice, um, a lot of people, working scientists, rarely do this, even, even for grants. They, they do some of these things, uh, more or less, but uh, it, is, it is fairly rare to do all of these things. And we just, we just don't train students in applied fields um, to do this. But this is what best practice looks like. And again, I'll, I'll use an example of a uh, field that has very tight um, standards, human medical biology, especially clinical trials, um, you would never in a million years be able to collect any data unless you had done this. Uh, we really, if we take what we do seriously, should should aspire to do this for any kind of science. And uh, the last thing that I have is um, a picture of the scientific method, the way we teach to children, where we um, we uh, may may have some question that uh, is a hypothesis, and um, but it usually starts off as as merely something we're curious about or um, something that is uh, uh, we want to work around. And we do background research and uh, look at the existing evidence, and from that we get serious and we formulate a hypothesis, conduct our experiment, data collection, and perform our analysis, and then communicate it and the cycle goes on. This is what we teach to the kids. But really, we should be doing something different. In fact, um, best practice dictates that we do. So we should, uh, th this part of the, of the um, process is the same, where we you know, use background research and our, our curiosity and knowledge to uh, formulate a serious hypothesis. But really, we should be designing our experiments. Um, we should be using existing evidence. We should be explicitly formulating and stating, thinking about, arguing about 
taking advice from others, um, communicating, uh, our effect size. The, remember, the effect size is what what a quantity we think relates to how right our how correct our hypothesis is. We should really be taking that very seriously. Should be conducting power analysis if we're doing null hypothesis testing, because um, as we'll learn in the next few weeks, this relates to um, how likely it is, uh, even if our hypothesis is correct. How likely it is we're we're likely to to uh, conclude our alternative hypothesis, and then um, when we design our experiment around the same time we should formulate our statistical hypothesis. You know we should pick our stats test, and we should communicate this in a statistical analysis plan. Only then should we collect data. Um, a lot of people do come to me. I'm I'm. Uh, I guess I'm sorry to say it this way, but uh, a lot of people do come to me for stats advice and they've collected the data and uh, essentially they're asking me, how do I analyze this? You know, they haven't thought about that yet. And sometimes it works out and we're able to find a solution and, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and then we have the results and conclusions. I think that's my last slide. We have the practice exercises. So uh, that's it. Sorry we went over time yet again. I'm going to discard my annotations. Any comments or uh, thoughts on that stuff? Is everybody um, still with us? <laughs> I'm seeing Megan there. And I uh, decided to work home today, but I think Megan and I will co-present next week. And um, we will uh, we'll both see you see you then. So if everything's good, I recommend running through this code on your own before next week, practicing those few things, do some weird stuff and try to break the graphs that I suggest and try to make some even better ones. And uh, I'll see everybody next week. Thanks for coming, guys. See, I'm going to stop the uh, recording here. Thanks, Ned. See everybody later. All, always a pleasure. Thanks. See you next week. See everybody. <laughs>